and you were just a consummate host and showed my wife and me such a, a beautiful evening, both there and Minton's next door. A, you know, I almost, uh, I, I was looking for the photo we took together with JJ. Um, oh, I'm right. I'm going to find it. I'm going to post it. <laughs> Please do. Send me that if you get that. <laughs> I will. So, um, before we get too far, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't um, shout out and recognize the plug, Kaiser Permanente. Um, thank you, Kaiser, for underwriting my residency at the Museum of the African Diaspora over the past five years. They've been so supportive of the work that um, we've been doing at the museum and just my vision of really, you know, bringing uh, conversations around food and health and justice and all the issues that I care about and I know that you care about uh, yeah. into a museum space and really using that as a model to show that, um, you know, institutions that may not necessarily be kind of squarely focused on food issues, uh, that they can have programming around food. And, you know, it's been really inspiring. Uh, we get, you know, messages all the time from institutions around the country who are like, yo, we love this chef residency. How can we, if not kind of create a whole um, kind of replica of the model, bring some type of programming around food into um, our institution? So that's been really cool, just being able to be an inspiration in that way. <clears throat> fantastic. Um, uh, yeah. I think it's fantastic, Brian, because essentially um, the culinary arts is just that. It's a fine art. Um, and uh, having it there uh, at the museum raises its profile and puts it home where it, where it needs to, to be. Because essentially, you can't tell our story without our culinary um, uh, legacy and, uh, and foundation. And, and, and what, what better place than in a museum where uh, there is an environment to really express that. Um, so I'm excited about coming out there uh, at some point and carrying on with you and Morena White and uh, yeah. We got to do something. <laughs> oh, most most certainly. When when things get back to normal in 2025, uh... <laughs> the new normal. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we we would love to host you and whatever we can. You know what I want to do. What we will do is we're going to do a dinner. I don't want to just have yes. a conversation. I want to have. We, you know, we partner with the St. Regis Hotel next door, and we've had yeah. these what I call diaspora dinners. We're doing with Tanya Holland and Michael Twitty. And um, I would love to host one with um, Mr. Alexander Small so we can make I'm that happen. On my way. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of, um, you know, culinary arts, and, and I love how you talk about it being a fine art. You know, I think about you and I'm assuming your home is in Harlem, right? Yes, I am Harlem. Yeah. Um, uh, essentially, I moved to Harlem in the mid um, let's see, when did I get here? I moved to Harlem in 98. 98. Yes, I'd had two restaurants at that point, Cafe Beulah being the first, Sweet Ophelia the second, and um, uh, I was working on the third, Sweet Ophelia's in Grand Central Station when mm. I moved to Harlem. That was 98. When, where were you living before? Uh... <laughs> Uh, Park Avenue South and 22nd. Oh, uh, la di da, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a downtown, downtown boy. And before that in NoHo and before that in Soho. So, nice. you know, I've been wanting to live in Harlem since I was like four or five years old. It's, mm. a, it's an evolution from South Carolina. I finally got here and I'm staying. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Um, you know, I think about when I think about you and your kind of multi hyphenate existence in this world, I, I think about some of my favorite um, creatives from the, the Harlem Renaissance, you know, folks like Aaron yeah. Douglas, folks like, um, what's my favorite artist name? Uh, Jake Blarnt. Um, yes. You know, I think about his migration series that he created when he was 23. And I think about, you know, you migrating from the South to the North. Um, first of all, were you, wh where did you live? I know you were from South Carolina, but was it a rural town or where were you living? Uh, where did you grow no, up in South Carolina? No, I, grew, I grew up in Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, which is in the Northwestern part of the state, but 
I grew up in a Geechee Gullah household. My mm. father's family was from Charleston, um, uh, James Island. My grandmother was from Buford. And um, essentially, uh, it, we were like a low country family in up country is what they call it. Mm. Um, Badenburg is probably the third largest uh, or fourth largest city, industrial BMW, right next to Greenville, um, uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, you know, it was right at the foothills of the Piedmont. And, okay. um, and uh, it was a very sophisticated uh, 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 city or small city. Um, mm -hmm. There were uh, a number of prominent you know, uh, colleges. Um, uh, there used to be an opera company in Spartanburg, a concert hall. It was one of the main hubs for the railroad. So there was a lot of industrialized um, um, uh, uh, businesses and things like that. Um, and, you know, I was able to get a, an exceptional education. Mm. You, um, I'm assuming you did have family that came from the rural South and moved into the city. Is that, um, you know, kind of like the flow? I'm just wondering about, you know, the kind of connection to the land that you might have had. Um, oh, I, outside of like an urban center, thinking about like some of those practices that, you know, Southerners often brought to cities when oh, they moved from the rural South to the urban South. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, in my first book, Grace the Table, I talk about my grandfather being a city farmer. Uh, he grew up uh, uh, in Charleston uh, working from a very early age, like 12, um, uh, on farms. And uh, he worked in the rice paddy fields. Um, and so when he moved the family to Spartanburg, um, uh, we had three homes, my parents' home, my grandfather's home, my uncle's home. And in the middle of that was about a third of an acre that was grandpa's garden. Mm. And the garden was the center of my universe and my life. Uh, you know, I come from a family of, of folks who cooked. On my mother's side, her father, her uncle, um, and her, her grandfather were cooks and chefs. On my father's side, his, his brother and his sister. So uh, food was everything. It was currency. It was language. It mm. was how we expressed, uh, essentially, um, uh, our humanity uh, and also our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So in that garden, I uh, essentially uh, learned uh, some mindful lessons from my grandfather, who wasn't a church going man, he said that garden was his church. And he would yeah. tell stories about <laughs> the land, you know, these stories about planting, the importance of knowing about your food, where it came from. Um, mm -hmm. And he would rent land property uh, in the country for livestock. And so uh, uh, a few times a week, I would go with him to feed his livestock. I also went with him when it was slaughter time. You know, so I was mm. very much involved with all those practical farm skills yep. in the city. <laughs> mm. I love that. I mean, you know, I think about myself, I think about a lot of the younger kind of food creatives and just people who appreciate art and culture and music and all the things that you bring into the world. And we mostly know you as, um, at, at least I, I initially knew you as a, a restaurateur as a chef, as a cookbook author, but um, you know, you have this deep passion for and had a very uh, successful career as an opera singer. And so, <laughs> you know, even before we talk about like, just when you were actually like doing this professionally, and I think you, you moved to, uh, was it Philly to go to school? To, yes, to go to grad school at Curtis Institute of Music, the mm -hmm. same place that denied Nina Simone. Um, what? Uh, and, <laughs> yes. And um, now, okay. So uh, my journey, um, quite simply, uh, when I was very young, um, I was very much excited by the arts. Um, when I was born, my aunt and uncle, who uh, were very much part of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, my uncle was a chef in Harlem, my aunt was a classical pianist. Um, they had, had tried to have children for years and, and unsuccessfully. So when I was born, I was the first, uh, uh, and as it turns out, only male 
uh, in the family of my father's, my grandfather's uh, five kids. Mm -hmm. So my aunt and uncle moved from Harlem back to Spartanburg to be a part of my education. And wow. uh, I know it was an extraordinary gift uh, mm -hmm. because they were determined to make sure that I was to be everything that they didn't have the possibilities of being. Yes. And that generation, uh, you know, my parents, that, that was the whole point. The whole po they understood that they were uh, essentially caretakers for a brighter future. And that mm -hmm. future was through their kids. Yes. And so they put everything in those kids um, and uh, at whatever cost. So imagine, um, you know, piano lessons, art lessons, dance lessons, all these things. Um, they made it happen because they saw that as uh, the future. Yep. So my aunt and uncle, essentially, they moved back. My uncle uh, essentially uh, was a, a character. He, he played piano by ear. Uh, he was a chef uh, and a bit of a lush. Um, uncle liked to drink. Uh, <laughs> and what made them even more so colorful is that um, uh, they both were Jehovah Witnesses. Now, oh. this, this was a difficult thing for my father, who was Southern Baptist, and my mm -hmm. mother, who had been Episcopalian, became Southern Baptist for, for my father. Uh, but my father was afraid that they were going to induct me in some kind of ritual behavior because he didn't get it. <laughs> um, you know, my whole thing was they had the best food and the best music. And mm. it's, I love spending time with the Jehovah Witnesses because they fed me. I mean, they fed me well. And they let me sing solos and bang on the piano. So I was mm -hmm. in heaven. Yeah, but that's beautiful. transitioning through that, my aunt and uncle really exposed me uh, to the world through, through the arts. Um, as a young kid, I'd listen to Shakespeare, uh, Langston Hughes. Uh, I was reciting sonnets and poems, you know, uh, before I could read, because I, yeah. I, 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 I just learned them by, by heart. Um, I was taking my piano lessons and I was cooking with my uncle who mm -hmm. essentially taught me to dream when I cooked and experiment and food was uh, to be fun and cooking was to be um, uh, an experience, an adventure. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it started for me. Mm -hmm. when, when you I moved... Moved... Sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to, 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 to connect the dots with my classical music. So yeah. early on, I realized I wanted to be uh, a classical musician. At first, I thought it was a classical pianist. Um, but then I discovered my voice. Uh, yeah. I discovered Ed Sullivan and, and Leontine Price singing on Ed Sullivan and Marilyn Horn and Joan Sutherland. And um, I, I realized that the that, that the classical music was something that my soul yearned for. And my uncle and aunt had this record player. They would play old recordings of Renata Tobaldi, Caruso, um, mm. all these famous Italian singers. And I fell in love with this as if it was an out-of-body experience. Mm. Now imagine that as a, a, a black Southern boy in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, running around in, um, you know, uh, uh, an all white environment, um, uh, you know, singing all this stuff and people are going, who is this boy? Mm. Ah! Mm -hmm. That was the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. Did you study voice as an undergrad? I studied voice uh, as an undergrad and grad. I also studied, I had a private voice teacher from the the local conservatory uh, mm. come to my house and teach me in junior high school. Uh, my parents understanding that I needed my own studio. Uh, I got rid of my bed, got a sofa couch, put my piano in my room, which my mother was happy about because I was no longer screaming and hollering in the, in the living room. <laughs> and, you know, my, my voice teacher would come to me uh, once a week. <laughs> so, Yes. <laughs> This is how it started. Yeah. When you were young, I, I guess, did you ever like imagine yourself? It sounds like you could have imagined yourself being a professional, um, you know, artist, musician, pianist. But did you ever imagine yourself 
in any way being involved in the food world? Not in a professional way. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be um, a famous opera singer uh, who traveled all over the world, all over the world. Certainly the traveling all over the world part happened. Um, uh, and I felt like one day I would open, when I retired, I'd open a little, little inn with my own kitchen and just do that. But no, I didn't imagine that I was going to uh, become a chef restaurateur. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like you have visitors. I have these <laughs> these children out here, and so it's funny. <laughs> it, it's funny, you know, when you when you talked about that old school way of, um, you know, your the the way in which your aunt and uncle were trying to educate you and help you be more worldly and all these things. I, I think about that because I have some mentors who had that similar kind of upbringing. And so I'm always thinking about ways to incorporate those type of kind of parenting um, tools and in my own parenting. And so things like, you know, music, you know, we started um, our, our oldest daughter, um, Mila, in cello when she was three. And now she's doing cello and piano. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we built this, uh, this work shed out here. Um, oftentimes for me, but mostly for her. So she can like be out here and like making all her noise and not have to disturb us in the house. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's how I got my piano in my bedroom. My mm -hmm. mother had to thank, thank God. Right. But, you know, to the point that you're making, you know, Brian, uh, you know, um, kids, may, kids are maybe your very best recipe. You know, because essentially I look at life as a series of recipes, you know, <laughs> and at some point you get to the table and people get to enjoy it, whatever yes. it is. Mm -hmm. um, but th the best thing my parents did for me, now imagine this, a little black boy in the South running around reciting classical uh, uh, Shakespeare, uh, John Donne, uh, screaming uh, opera and recital music in three or four different languages. Um, mm -hmm. That's not the plan they had for me. Uh, yep. you know, maybe the first black president, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, but clearly they'd never seen a black opera singer that, mm -hmm. that looked like them. They, they didn't, they, and especially a black man. Yeah. They, it, it didn't, they didn't understand it. I mean, quite frankly, my mother didn't think I had a job until I opened my first restaurant. <laughs> she used to tell people, you know, I, I, I would be in the newspaper, I would winning this award, doing this and that and the other, and traveling all over the world uh, singing. And she would, people would say, you must be so proud of him. Mm -hmm. And she would say, well, I am, but I wish he'd get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I, can, is. I can relate. Trust me, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> When, when I left the um, doctoral program at NYU to go to cooking school, my parents uh, were livid and they didn't really feel like I was doing anything till I got my first book contract. I was doing a lot of stuff, but then they were like, oh, okay, now you, you, you're doing right. something for real now. So. <laughs> yeah. So you opened your first restaurant, Cafe Beulah in Manhattan in, yes. was it 94? In 94. Yes, 94. it's early 94, yeah. And um, I know that a lot of people kind of credit you or, or say that you were very influential in terms of like celebrating um, and, and I don't know, maybe even bringing low country cooking to um, New York City. Were there any other restaurants around that time that were um, uplifting and, and making low country cooking in um, Manhattan or in, I don't know, throughout the five boroughs around that time? Oh, you know, um, I think the best way I can answer that question is um, there were other black restaurants and there were some that featured uh, low country dishes. But what I uh, did, um, having traveled all over the world uh, as an opera singer and firsthand experiencing what fine dining was all about, um, what uh, essentially elevated service was all about, um, uh, when I decided to go into the uh, restaurant business um, and 
a lot of that was because I hit a glass ceiling. I hit the glass ceiling in opera for black uh, men, essentially. Uh, we, and even today, because I mentor young uh, black male opera singers, um, uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for uh, men to excel. Women mm. were exotic. You right. Know? So you had going back as far as Marion Anderson, who essentially with, uh, with uh, First Lady Roosevelt uh, yep. was able to break through. Um, Le- Leontine Price, Grace Bromary, my very good friend, who uh, we just lost recently, Jesse Norman, my close friend, mm-hmm. Catherine Battle. All these women, um, they were able to, um, to uh, excel. But black men weren't afforded that opportunity. So Mm -hmm. um, it was, I I was living in Paris at the time. Um, It's funny, I was auditing classes at La Varenne, the cooking school, and Mm. studying at the opera house, uh, the Paris Opera House. Um, And Kathleen Battle arranged for me to have an audition at the Met, which was my third audition, I think. I was being represented by Cami Artists, Columbia. And uh, um, I came in to do this uh, audition and usually you sing an aria and then maybe you begin another one and then they tell you, you know, yes, no, whatever. Mm-hmm. I sang two full arias, started another, and then they said to me, well, I can see you've grown a lot. You know, you worked in Paris with Madame Etov, you, and I studied with Tito Golbi, the great mm-hmm. uh, Scarpia um, from Tosca in Rome. And they said, oh, I, you've done great. We'd really like to work with you. Um, we are uh, have a new production of Porgy and Bess, and we thought maybe some chorus and some character roles. Well, I was stunned because I had won a Grammy and a Tony for Porgy and Bess in a lead role, and now this is what they were offering me, uh, uh, sort of crumbs at the table. And that was so important because at that point is when I decided I was no longer going to pursue an operatic career. I was done. Mm. And 18 months to the day after that, I was building Cafe Bueller. That's how it happened. So I know that you won a Grammy. When did that happen? (laughs) Now you're dating me, the late 70s. years are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess my point, well, first of all, um, you know, I, I I just feel like it's so unfortunate that so often, you know, you think about like um, this tradition starting in the early 20th century of Black artists often having to go to Europe in yeah. order to be embraced and, you know, have their work celebrated. And then, you know, America wants to invite people back after that. But, um, you know, I think about that. I mean, you could, one would argue that that's kind of like the pinnacle of one's career in terms of like accolades. And so um, I was just wondering, you know, with those two things on your belt, if you've ever, you know, felt any inclination to kind of pivot back into singing um, or, you know, if you're just kind of like, you know, professionally that is, or if you just kind of pass that. Well, funny you should ask. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're all over the place, but um, <laughs> uh, not for my supper. I mean, uh, becoming a, a chef restaurateur um, took the pressure uh, and the craziness out of singing because I love to sing. It was a huge joy for me. But when you have that strange cocktail of race um, and art and power and money and politics, uh, and you are essentially the person they're trying to keep out. Um, you know, singing had become painful. Mm. And so um, many, many, many years after the fact, uh, what's interesting about your question is that uh, I just finished a turn in the studio uh, the first time in a gazillion years. Mm. And I've completed a recording that is also entitled Mills, Music and Muses. Uh, my African American <laughs> songbook, and uh, co- uh, 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 COVID nineteen happened, so um, the release has been postponed. But soon yeah. come, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I don't know. If, I don't know if you know that I come from a musical background. My family, my uncle um, Don Bryant was a head songwriter at High Records, this old label in Memphis. My aunt was yeah. Ann Peebles. And for a while, you know, Don, he just stepped away from music. Well, you know, he, he, he I'll say he stepped away from secular music and he was just kind of quietly doing a lot of gospel music. But at 77, he just um, two years ago re -release, or released his first secular album, phenomenally successful. And he um, was supposed to be releasing another one then COVID-19 hit. But interestingly, his biggest fan base, you know, he will get some clubs over here, but Europe. I mean, this dude is huge in Europe. He's been touring in Italy, France, right. and like right. selling out like venues. So, um, right. you know. Well, because traditionally they didn't have the problem with color. Talent yeah. was enough. Talent yeah. was everything. Mm -hmm. And and so um, uh, I also think a lot of Europeans embrace, particularly African Americans, uh, yeah. uh, because they didn't embrace Americans, white yeah. Americans. So uh, it, it was sort of I lived in in Paris for five years, um, on and off. I kept an apartment there, and uh, the the relationship that Paris has had with African Americans is choice because. They love African Americans in a way that they don't like their own um, colonists that right. they, uh, enslaved all over the world. But yeah. African Americans show up; they, the Europeans go crazy. You yeah, know? yeah. I don't I know if you spent any time in Paris. Do you remember a restaurant in Paris uh, in Pigalle called Haynes? I don't. So Leroy Haynes was a soldier who, uh, after World War II, uh, got caught in Paris fell in love with somebody, carried on, and then essentially uh, he, he, um, he opened a restaurant uh, that became sort of like the fabulous uh, spot where all the celebrities, the au courant, um, um, you know, th there were photos on the wall from Nina Simone to Elizabeth Taylor to everybody. Mm. It was the joint. Mm, mm -hmm. and and we went to Paris after you finished with all your French sauces and your French, you know, and you, you knew you needed some, some Alabama good food. Mm -hmm. You made your way to Pigalle, which was a little shady, a lot shady. And, <laughs> you, made, and you got into Leroy Hangs and you opened that door and behind that big old curtain, it was a joint. Mm. And everybody was there. It didn't matter, rich, poor, famous, they were all up in there. When did Shay Haynes close? Oh dear. Well, it was opened in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he died in, uh, and his daughter, who years later uh, interviewed for a job at my first restaurant, Cafe Beulah, years later, <laughs> she tried to keep it open for a while, but mm -hmm. um, I don't think it made it into the 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was in Paris, I, I was just scouring the whole city for like black restaurant. Well, I should say African American, uh, yes. Southern black restaurants. But I, I, the only thing I could find was Senegalese restaurants. So that's kind of where uh, I got my black fix. <laughs> well, over in uh, the eighteenth, uh, the eighteenth out on these mall. Now, uh, funny story. I write about this um, in Grace the Table. When I was living in Paris, um, I was very close to Dee Dee Bridgewater, the great jazz singer. And she had moved to Paris after um, um, a, a stint on Broadway. And she was doing a whole residency thing uh, in Paris. And she was living in uh, the, I think it was the 18th Arrondissement, where a lot of the Africans lived. So when she would come visit me, I lived across from Notre Dame, she would be my okra courier. She would, mm. give her my, she would bring in tons and tons of okra for me. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm addicted to okra any kind mm -hmm, of way. Mm -hmm. uh, okra sandwiches with sliced tomato. I mm. mean, she would bring me my okra. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so going back to Cafe Beulah, this is just on a practical level. I mean, I talk to restaurateurs nowadays and folks talk about just the hurdles that one has to... Um, you know, get over just to open a restaurant. And I'm just wondering, you know, kind of like logistically and just financing all that, 
can you talk a little bit about just like deciding yeah. to open a restaurant and then yeah. like the practical steps to actually making that happen? I will, but but you reminded me of something I didn't finish because we were talking okay. about black uh, restaurants. Um, I would like, uh, uh, if my memory serves me, and of course everything is up for debate, but essentially you're asking me about other uh, Southern restaurants and this sort of thing. Uh, I mean, this is the interesting thing is that most people don't understand that black folks do all kinds of food and, 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 and we do regional food and we do heritage food. And depending on where your ancestors come from uh, really defines your food. But yeah. essentially, somewhere, you know, back in the 70s, essentially, any time a black person stood over a stove, they were making soul food. I could have opened an Italian restaurant, and they would have said Italian with soul. Right. Uh, so, so, so our food has really not been allowed to breathe and be all the different things that it is. Now, yeah. with that said, I set out with uh, Cafe Beulah to open uh, what I think became the first fine dining African-American restaurant in New York. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is uh, essentially, I took uh, traditional foods of the, the world I knew, which was the Gullah Geechee culture. Those were the foods that we, I grew up on. And traveling around the world, I understood that fine dining had a lot to do with taking traditional local cooking and putting it in a modern setting. Right. Uh, applying um, modern uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, so that it, you know, elevated the food's presence and uh, really shaped. Uh, it's kind of like fashion because, mm -hmm. you know, because food is also fashion. Yep. So, so I created that experience. And to my knowledge, there wasn't an experience like that. Now you had B. Smith and you had Jezebel's doing uh, B. Smith's food, I would say, was more continental. I mm. would say Jezebel's was, it started out as being Southern and then moved into a continental place. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, but I was trying to define um, for, um, you know, the contingencia, the, my clients, what, uh, uh, how extraordinary a Southern culinary experience could be with fine yeah. ingredients and, mm -hmm. and, and preparation, um, uh, you know, really as worthy, if not more so, uh, as French or Italian or anything else that you freely run around here saying is yeah. old, old, old Caron, old cuisine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's what we were doing at Cafe Bielma. I love that. I mean, I've heard of your food described as Southern Revival, yeah, uh, cuisine. Is that a term that you coined, that I, or is that something that was kind of imposed on what you're doing? No, no, it was it was how I mean. Every time I've done anything, for example, my first three restaurants all were what I call Southern Revival cooking, based on Low Country cooking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, twelve years later, when I created the Cecil um, and decided to take the culinary conversation from the African American experience to the world. I mm -hmm. understood that we were so many things before we got to America. And I wanted uh, to bring it all together. So I spent <clears throat> years traveling and following the, 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 the slave uh, uh, trade route. Um, and I, I, I understood that Africa changed the global culinary narrative on five continents. Yes. So that's how I came up with Afro-Asian American cooking because mm -hmm. I wanted uh, something. It was an incredible opportunity to create a culinary discipline that didn't exist um, in that way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as an artist, and I am an artist first, and then yes. I'm everything else. As an artist, I had a clean canvas. Mm -hmm. And I just, pulled, I just pulled out a brush and went crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us about some of those global culinary convergences of African diasporic and Asian diasporic food that you found while traveling? Well, the first thing that I noticed, and, and uh, I wrote a lot of this in my first book, I started to notice the familiar ingredients that people used all over the world. 
And then, so you, then you start to have a conversation with yourself, how did these ingredients get here? And then you look into the DNA of that particular country and culture, and you see that uh, essentially the business of slavery um, uh, transported people that look like you with your heritage all over the world. I mean, yeah. those people are so unaware that there were slaves in China dating back to the 1500s, the mm -hmm. Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Africa's been in the slave business for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not that the rest of the world wasn't, but yeah. Africa had the best crop. I mean, mm -hmm. let's, I mean let's, those African genes were the best. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so if you were going to enslave someone, you were going to enslave the best mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you want your money's worth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And importing all that agricultural knowledge to exploit as well. Um, but, you know, Brian, you asked me because because we're all over the place and, and I and I apologize for, for my. No, it's cool. I want this to be free flowing. So this this it'll, it'll go where it needs to go. It goes. But you were mm -hmm. asking me about uh, uh, how did one start a restaurant? Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, um, you know, we're talking 25 years now. Yeah. Um, you know, so the business has changed a whole lot, needless to say. But, you know, um, uh, my mother used to say about me, uh, I worry about that boy. He doesn't have sense enough to know what he doesn't know. Mm. And he certainly doesn't have sense enough to be afraid of what he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And essentially what, what, uh, what she meant by that is that there was nothing I didn't think I could do yeah. if I set my mind to it. And once I decided on something, uh, I had to do it. I couldn't rest until I did it. So after the rejections at the Met for the third time, um, and uh, I woke up the next day, um, ready to get busy with my new life. Um, I got busy. I understood that in order to uh, control my own fate, my own destiny, I had to not only have a seat at the table, I had to own the table. Mm -hmm. I had to own the table. Yeah. I couldn't own an opera house, but I could own a restaurant. It was my second great love. I'd been in training for it all my life. Um, and I had spent all my opera money uh, entertaining people at my apartment and somebody else needed to pay for dinner. And so <laughs> here we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I said, okay, this is what I can do. This is what I love. And I've never been able to do anything I didn't love. Um, the, the, one of the biggest problems my family had with me is I wouldn't work. I mean, you know, like people get these little summer jobs or after school jobs. I hated it. I would take extra mm -hmm. classes in school. I would get more involved in extra things. I didn't have time. I was in two Boy Scout uh, groups. Anything to keep <laughs> me from having to have a job. Mm -hmm. and so, which is the other reason she worried about me. But um, I had a passion for this. And so I've had to figure out how do you open a restaurant? How does this happen? So I did a lot of reading and mm -hmm. I befriended <clears throat> a lot of folks and asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found out is in order to get this thing, to realize this thing, I need a business plan. I needed a proposal. I needed something that created my idea on yep. paper that I could sell to people. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to a friend of mine who uh, was in, had recently gotten in the restaurant business and he told me about this incredible textbook at Columbia University. Well, I mean, I told you I was an artist. I mean, the idea that I was going to read this technical, thick-ass book. I mean, <laughs> I was like, but I went, I bought it. It cost $70. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like, what? I bought it. I got addicted to it. I just read through it. And, and then another friend loaned me a business plan uh, mm. to see how you put these together. So I wrote a business plan. Mm -hmm. I wrote a very good business plan. Nice. And then I started calling up friends and, and folks that I knew, telling them what I wanted to do. Everybody thought it was brilliant. Everybody wanted to be involved. Let me know when you're ready. I love this idea, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. That was great, except I... I, 
I thought I was ready, but apparently I didn't have what it took to close the deal. The proposal introduced it, but what happens next? So a lawyer friend of mine said, okay, you need a, you need a subscription agreement. You need to create shares. You need to, you need to essentially create an intellectual property with all of its parts so people have a sense of what they're investing in. Uh, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and it's kind of like a prenup too, because in case you have to get rid of them, uh, you need to have rules and regulations to do that. Yeah. You know, so uh, a friend agreed to uh, solicit um, uh, his law firm to support me in that endeavor, endeavor and help me put together that subscription agreement mm -hmm. and that plan. Mm -hmm. So that that with the proposal and the subscription agreement, I was ready to go out into the world and say, I have this brilliant idea. Here it is. I have this subscription agreement. This is how you participate in helping me make yeah. my dream come true. Nice. So I did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you remember I tell you I had all these people all lined up saying, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that group dispersed quickly. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody's on board until they're not. Right. Until it's time to write that check. Well, you exactly. Know, got paid off. Well, it just lost all these shares in the stock market. Well, uh, 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 somebody ran off with, so I had to help. Whatever. Bottom line is that I was ready and, and a lot of other folks weren't. Yeah. So... I, it, uh, what it did is it allowed me to get down to the essence of people who were real and people who weren't. Mm. So I went to my close friends. And I was very fortunate because they heard me. They believed in me. They had eaten at my house. They knew I knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know I didn't know how to run a restaurant, but that's another thing. But they knew that I, if anybody could create an event, a place, um, this this black owned restaurant that was going to be fine dining that was going to attract everybody from all over the world they mm -hmm. felt it was me and mm -hmm. so i was able to convince some very close friends uh to throw their hat in the ring uh, to get it started and they mm -hmm. also were kind of like bait uh one of my first closest dearest friends who we also lost this past year, Tony Morrison. Mm. Tony wrote that check. <laughs> Tony wrote that check while 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 snacking on some of my mother's bread and butter pickles. Okay. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> we used to we used to meet up a few times uh, a month, always once a month for for lunch. Uh, but but I, I was constantly having dinner parties, and she was there. And she threw her hat in the ring. Mm. Felicia Rashad came to my rescue, threw her hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. Percy Sutton, um, many of you may remember uh, WBLS and Apollo Theater. Mm -hmm. um, he owned all that stuff. He was from Texas. And Percy was like a godfather. And he got on board. And then I had this great friend, Artie Pacheco, who worked on Wall Street. And he helped me organize some Wall Street money. I didn't raise enough money, but my ambition and my dreams were bigger than my bank account. And I got it done. I got <laughs> I, somehow. Listen, the week before we were opening, because I had blown the budget. I just blown the budget. Mm -hmm. I'd never managed so much money in my life. I'd blown the budget and I didn't even have money to buy groceries. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and the kitchen, everybody was ready, the staff. I probably had enough for one or two more payrolls, but I mean, mm -hmm. I went to my dear friend, Kathleen Battle, uh, the great opera singer. Yes. And I said, I don't have any groceries. She wrote that check. She wrote that check and we opened. And it was truly by the grace of God and some heavy praying and and some incredible cooking mm -hmm. that, that we, we took off. 
I mean, there was no room for failure because I had no money. Mm -hmm. But I had the biggest dream of my life. And that's how it happened. Now, I know you, I'm assuming you were involved in most aspects of the restaurant from design to <laughs> tableware, everything. Were you actually in the kitchen cooking as well? Or did you have a chef? Who I was... started out. I started out. This is interesting because, again, people would come to the restaurant to see me. So it, it, it became a huge conflict uh, with me trying to cook and people coming in the kitchen. I came to see you. Uh, are we going to hang out? Blah, blah. And so I, I, I immediately understood that what my role was, was to entertain my guests with my food. Mm -hmm. So how do I do that? And I had to figure it out quick. I was very fortunate to have the young chef, Leslie Parks, Gordon Parks. Young Leslie, chef. yes. Leslie, that's my girl. <laughs> that's my girl. That's my first child. Um, Leslie was there. She got it. We created, I mean, essentially, uh, for, this is how I understood how to work for all the previous rest, for all the, the other restaurants to come. I would create menu, flavor profile, um, flavor vocabulary, um, and essentially uh, my chef uh, de cuisine executed. And I was out front meeting, greeting. People used to come in. This one man came in. I'll give you an example. Came in and said, is this the restaurant where the owner comes to visit you at your table? And so <laughs> the staff, and I was at home at the time. I hadn't walked around to the restaurant yet. And so the manager said, yes, yes, he does. He said, well, will he come to our table? She said, yeah, yes. when well, you're here in the restaurant, he'll come. She says, all right, well, I need to know. Because, I mean, I'm, I came because people said the chef act the chef uh, owner actually comes to the table. Mm -hmm. When I got in, um, uh, well, they called me and said, okay, I hope you're coming in time because there's there's a couple here and this is what they want more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So I rushed and got myself over there and uh, he was waiting. <laughs> and I made my rounds. I went to the table. I talked with them and they became regulars, mm. you know. But yeah, that was the experience. So I, so, so I understood that um, being in the kitchen was not going to work. Yeah. Because what? Yeah. Um, well, I want to jump to the CISO for a second, but I, I, when you mentioned Leslie, I was um, <laughs> I got a chance to hang out with Elizabeth, um, her mother, um, at the end of Liz. last year. Yeah, I love and, her. You've rubbed elbows with some of the, you know, the the intelligentsia, the cultural, uh, culture's finest. Like, you know, t tell us. I know you don't like to brag. I know you're humble, but can you tell us just <laughs> some of the um, the the many brilliant, um, creative, amazing black folks and others that you've run across as kind of the godfather. Of Harlem, uh, somebody referred to you. Uh, Yoshi Jenkins said you the guy from really? Harlem, which oh, wow. I'd be willing to. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people that would beat me down for that. <laughs> um, listen, let me say this: um, there is no finer high than to walk into your restaurant and, uh, and Aretha Franklin is sitting in the middle of the room with five hairdressers. Okay, there's no, there's no greater. <laughs> or Catherine Deneuve sitting at the bar. Black Hollywood hub. Uh, when George um, Clooney hosted Saturday Night Live, my good buddy Eric LaSalle brought the entire cast to Cafe Bueller. So you can imagine, I mean, um, I've been very fortunate to know a lot of the movers and and people doing extraordinary stuff on the planet uh, while I'm here. <laughs> and that pleases me, without question. And, you know, look, I cook. 
I cook, I cook. People come. People will come to your house if you cook. Are you kidding? <laughs> no. that um you know kind of modern approach to you know some older techniques so i'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh the cecil chef jj and just that whole um period of, of your work i mean look to be honest with you i didn't even realize that you had a restaurant in between cafe beulah <laughs> and the cecil um but so i'm kind of skipping over that but i, I do want to um you know be mindful <laughs> of time and just hear a little bit about um, sure. just the, the well, whole actually, cafe of Cecil Tinger. You had two in between guys? I had two between. <laughs> I'm, yeah, slipping. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay, slipping. I'm so slipping, Alexander. My restaurant. <laughs> no, no. My restaurants. The first is Cafe Beulah. The second was Sweet Ophelia in uh, Soho. The third was Shoebox Cafe, celebrating the Shoebox Lunch in Grand Central Station. Mm. A 10-year hiatus traveled Africa and Asia, blah, 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 South America. And then Dick Parsons and I joined forces and opened the Cecil and reopened uh, Minton's Playhouse. Mm -hmm. That's my journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's get let's get down. I had to walk outside. I think the connection was a little spotty. So I don't have my notes in front ah, of me right now. But let's talk about your new book. Um, well, before we talk about that book, I, I want to talk about, because I, when I decided to, you know, leave grad school, go into cooking, I was doing a lot of research on African-American cookbooks, and I ran across your first cookbook, which seems was influenced by um, a lot of the, what you were trying to create at Cafe Beulah. And one of the things I appreciate about all your books is that they all have this texture of autobiography, and you're not just talking about the recipes um, but you're really, you know, sharing these stories about your travels, your friendships, your journeys, you know, and also giving more, you know, background about the food. So I'm interested to know just, well, um, Brian, yeah. Right. You know, I see myself um, uh, in a kind of broader narrative. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, first, I'm an artist. Secondly, I'm a host. Um and then um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to cook. And those things come together in that way. Uh, but uh, part of, of the, the ambiance and landscape of what I do is cultural. It's uh, in social. You know, uh, I sometimes describe myself as a self-described social minister, which is really about nurturing and, and, and ministering to uh, to people, to the culture, mm -hmm. with the tools that are my best friends, which is food and music. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything starts there for me uh, in this journey. Um, all of my books will always be about storytelling uh, because I need to give you context. You know, a recipe is a recipe, uh, but when you give it context, and something to stand on, then it becomes uh, a lifestyle. Then you get to experience uh, the person who created the mm -hmm. dish itself. So I want to go back in here because I feel like folks need to actually see a copy of this beautiful book. My book. <laughs> here we Everybody go. Everybody see this? <laughs> oh, you got yours too. Okay. <laughs> oh, I happen to have one. Signed. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a gorgeous book, Alexander. I feel like it's timely. I feel like it. Um, 
you know, it's just what we need in this moment. Just thinking about how can we take an opportunity to connect with, you know, even if it's just <laughs> virtually. But I, I, I've been using this book and I've been, um, you know, just thinking about all the ways in which we need to bring joy into our house in this moment. So, you know, just our, our little foursome and then music and, you know, dining out fresco in the backyard. And I'm just wondering what, you know, in terms of your vision of what you wanted this book to um, kind of evoke or what you were hoping it would kind of bring to the world or the, the, the um, intervention it would make in cookbook writing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, um, I'm a little bit of a, um, uh, what would be the word? Um, I, I, I kind of work outside of the box. Um, so essentially when I write, I'm not thinking cookbook, uh, as much as I'm thinking recipe book, I'm not thinking recipe for food as much as I'm thinking recipe for life. And, and so that becomes the backdrop of, of everything. This book for me, uh, is an important book because it comes at a time in my life that I've, that I've lived a seasoned life just like that black skillet, you know, <laughs> that cast iron <laughs> skillet. I've lived a seasoned life and that has equipped and, and gifted me with a view, um, uh, uh, several opinions and a consciousness. Um, but I've also been able to see a lot of things and experience a lot of things. And uh, I have uh, solid values um, uh, and things that I believe in that essentially define me now uh, and the rest of, uh, of my life. Mm -hmm. So I have a, I like to say that I have a view, you know, I've kind of walked up the mountain and I can see where I came from. Yeah. And I wanted to bring all of that uh, to this book. Um, not only am I telling you who I am and how I got there, but I'm also uh, sharing things that happened along the way and how I've been able to uh, curate my own life through food and music. Mm -hmm. For example, the first chapter, you know, the first chapter is jazz. Why is it jazz? You know, um, Wynton Marsalis wrote the introduction to my first book, Grace the Table. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I've had a long season friendship with Wenton. Mm -hmm. And he used to say about my cooking, you know, Smalls being there, <laughs> it's okay um, yeah you're saying um where were we i was talking about the book uh so so basically you know um i wanted to put my life in perspective and my interests and my dishes uh in in 
in um, musical um, um, uh, subjects. And so I, uh, you know, jazz was my uh, hors d'oeuvres and appetizers and, mm -hmm. and, and, and imp improvisational things that you kind of, kind of wet your whistle before you get into um, the seriousness of, of, of the meal, um, mm -hmm. you know. And then I went into uh, these other categories, for example, uh, spirituals, um, you know, which is my pastas and my grits and my grains. And, mm -hmm. and then uh, gospel is the garden, you know, the garden with my grandfather, the garden of life. I think about Edna Lewis and her planting and how sacred it, sacred it was. Um, you know, they would have... Uh, they would have, you know, prayer and rituals, um, not only when they planted uh, in the garden, but also when they, when they um, um, killed the livestock, you know, yes. everything had meaning and purpose. And, and then there's the music and the, and the music uh, that informs our culture like no other culture. Um, mm -hmm. So this is what this book is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. I love how you even describe it kind of as a playlist, um, the way in which you <laughs> conceived of putting it together. Um, Alexander, we don't want to hold you up for much longer, but before we go, I'm wondering if you could just tell us what are you cooking and eating these days? What's kind of a day in the life of Alexander Smalls in terms of like what you're putting on the table? <laughs> well, <laughs> probably, uh, you know, our listeners could tell better than I can because, you know, with my with with my crazy self, I've been cooking like crazy. What most people don't know is I have three refrigerators and a restaurant stove. And <laughs> <laughs> nice. So and I've been locked in this apartment for 60 days and counting. Yeah. Mm. So you know I am just throwing down all kinds of things from the ridiculous to the sublime. I'm doing mm -hmm. my Afro Italian, I'm doing my Afro Asian I'm mm. doing, you know, my 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 African uh, dishes, my Chinese dish. I'm walking myself crazy. Um, mm. I'm having a good time, you know. And I'm also I'm making my hot dogs. Everybody who knows me knows that I have a that, hot dog recipe in every book. I have three books. That, three. That's dogs. your comfort food, right? That's your go-to comfort it, food, right? Love it, love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you like, do you have someone deliver your food? Just practically, how are you getting like your, your um, ingredients, fresh produce and things like that? Oh, well, it's funny. I was just ordering from uh, Fairway before I jumped on here with mm. Instacart. So, I mean, I order stuff in. I've been working the, um, the mail order places like crazy, D'Artagnan, you know, all of them. Um, <laughs> and like maybe once, uh, once every three weeks, uh, I have a friend who comes and picks me up. Uh, I go down with my mask and my gloves, my hat, um, my can of disinfectant. I spray <laughs> and then I climb in the back, I, and I and then he takes me on my shopping journey for my boutique places. Like yes, I don't know if you saw that article in the Times where they followed me for a day. Um, yeah, but I go to my Russian delicatessen. Mm -hmm. I go to my Spanish gourmet store. I go to my African um, uh, market in uh, in the Bronx and pick up those things, those essentials. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alexander, thank you so much for taking time uh, right. to talk. As I said, once we get to whatever the new normal is and we open the museum and start programming, um, I, I would love to figure out a way to bring you out and just do Let's something do with you. Uh, once again, I want to I want to thank the plug. This is a handmade sign by my daughter, um, thanking the sponsor, the underwriter of my uh, residency, Kaiser. We appreciate your support and your commitment to improving community health and really seeing the work that we're doing as a way of educating the community and base building and getting people excited about, you know, thinking about the ways in which we can change our own habits and attitudes and politics regarding food, but also how can we think about uh, how can we be active in ensuring that our government, that elected officials are making policies that are in the best interest of everyday eaters, of everyday folks, and not just the big corporations that um, so often are determining what kind of policies we have around food. Um, have a great weekend, Alexander. 
Um, please, right, everyone, me, pick let me this book up. You. Uh, let me thank you. I have had a great time. And let me thank all of our friends and folks who are curious enough to tune in and, yes. and, and watch us go at it. Appreciate yep. all of them. What is that mm -hmm. term you use? Chop it up? <laughs> chopping it up. We're chopping it up. Yes. So please, um, thank you everyone for um, checking in. Please check this book out. If you can, I'd highly suggest getting it from a local bookseller. If you want to go even further, get it from a black bookseller. We need to, um, in this moment, it's, an, it's vitally important that we support independent businesses and independent black businesses um, need all the dollars that they can get. So um, 